All right, now here is a better picture of the, um, the gastrula. So if you notice the blue on the outside, this is ectoderm. Now this is the gastrula stage. The ectoderm over here, it tells you it's going to become your nervous tissue and your skin. So this is brain, nervous tissue, skin. The endoderm, which is this tan or light pink area right here, becomes your internal, your digestive organs, the lining of your digestive organs. The opening here to the gastrula, and I want you to know this word is called the blastopore. That's B-L-A-S-T-O-P-O-R-E. So pore means opening, and this is the blastopore. Now, as it pinches inward and forms this endoderm, what ends up this space is called the archenteron. That's A-R-C-H-E-N-T-E-R-O-N. -E and the archenteron is going to eventually become the gut of the animal. Now, lying between the ectoderm and the endoderm is this red area here, and this is mesoderm. Meso means middle. The mesoderm is eventually going to become our muscle tissue, circulatory, excretory, and our respiratory systems. So as we develop, after the sperm and the egg meet, that ball of cells undergoes a lot of divisions. And after 16 divisions, it's going to form the blastula. The blastula is going to divide more, and it'll pinch in. When it does, it forms this blastopore, and now the whole structure is called the gastrula. The archenteron is this area here where my pointer is, and it eventually is going to become the gut and the lining of the gut. So ectoderm means outside skin, brain, nervous tissue, and our skin. Endoderm means inside skin, so our very inner core, which is our digestive organs and the lining of our gut. And then in between the two is going to be mesoderm. And mesoderm is going to be forming everything in the middle. And this is our muscle, circulatory, excretory, and our respiratory, our lungs and our heart. Now, body plans. Um, everything has a body plan. You have a body plan. Starfish have a body plan. Everything has a body plan. And they are anatomical features in the animal's body that mark branching points on this evolutionary tree. So one of the things we have to talk about with our body plan is the type of symmetry. When we look at this tree, and I'm not going to ask you questions about it, but when you look at it, you can see that there are similarities embryological that we've developed with our anatomical features with the um, organisms before us. Certainly before us would be some of the um, great apes, and so, you know, we evolved from that. So we definitely have got the um, a, a body plan that is very similar. Here is your evolutionary tree. Um, to, you can take a look at it. We have our protists down here and then multicellular here. And as we go up, we will start with our sponges. They don't have tissues. So they are going to be our lowest animals. They do have cells. They're multicellular, but there's no tissues. To the right, we have tissue formation, and this is going to be our nidarians. That's our jellyfish. Then we just, they have radial symmetry because um, they're radiating out from a central axis. Just think of the spokes of a wheel. Bilateral symmetry, we're going to talk about our flatworms. And then there's going to be a body cavity where there's actually food being broken down into a cavity. We'll start with our roundworms. And then as we go up, we are chordates because we have a spinal cord. And if you notice, our closest relative here is the echinoderms, which is starfish. Now, I know this sounds really crazy, but our, uh, developmentally, 
echinoderms are our closest relative, and we'll talk about why that is, but it's developmentally. Certainly, he doesn't look anything like us, but developmentally-wise, he is. Under them are the arthropods. We will talk about all of your arthropods, so these are going to take in a lot of phylum, everything from our mollusks and um, on up through insecta. <clears throat> Below them, we have our annelids. These are our segmented worms. Segmentation is a big deal. If you, you're segmented, you have spinal, a spinal cord and you have vertebrae that are segmented. If you weren't not segmented, you would lose a lot of, flex, of flexibility. With the annelids, these are earthworms, they have external, for, uh, external segmentation. You can see their, their segmentation from the outside of their bodies. Below them, we will talk about our mollusks. Mollusks, um, these are going to be our snails. And then as we go down, you know, we go back down to our lowest of animals, the, the sponges. So we have all these developmental processes to go through. All right, real quickly, symmetry. Symmetry is an orderly arrangement of parts. That's what similar, sim, symmetry means. And some animals don't have any symmetry, so they're called asymmetrical. A means no, symmetry means no symmetry. So if you're asymmetrical, there's no, there's no form. Think of a, a sponge from the bottom of the ocean. I'm not talking about the kind you clean your kitchen with. I'm talking about like the brown sponge that, that you get, you know, uh, bath sponges, those kinds of things. Those don't have any symmetry. You know, there's no orderly arrangement of parts. That's your sponge here. Now, going up with your jellyfish, they're not dairy yet. They have radial symmetry. So they have this central area and they have an orderly arrangement of parts radiating out. Also, starfish have radial symmetry. Radial symmetry, you can see that their arms are radiating out from that central body. Then we have bilateral symmetry. We have bilateral symmetry. Bilateral symmetry means that you can put a plane down from head to toe, and we have symmetrical parts on either side. When you have bilateral symmetry, now we have parts to our body that are called anterior. Your anterior end is your head. Your posterior end is going to be your back end of the animal. Dorsal is your backside. Just think, because we say a dorsal fin on a shark is what you see out of the water. Dorsal is our back and ventral is our belly side. You only get these demarcations when you have bilateral symmetry. Animals that have radial symmetry do not get split into anterior, posterior, dorsal, or ventral. Also, with bilateral symmetry, there's what's called formation of a head end. We'll talk about it a little bit in just a minute. But when you have a head end, you have your concentration of sensory organs on the head. If you notice jellyfish, their sensory organs actually are in a net all over their body. Their stinging cells are. And then, of course, sponges, they don't have that at all. All right, cephalization means forming of a head. Cephalo means head. So when you're bilaterally symmetrical, you form a head. And this means that your nervous tissue, your senses are going to be located on your head or the anterior end of the animal so that there is a quick reaction time. I think we've said this before, but your eyes and your ears and taste and everything is concentrated on the head because sensory goes to the brain. We want a very quick reaction time with the brain in order to get a response in a timely manner. Like I said before, if our eyes were down at our knees and we saw that Rottweiler running towards us, by the time the message got up to our brain and back, we would, we would probably be rot chow. So we have to have this type of uh, cephalization associated with our sensory organs located on the head end. Now, another thing is that animals tend to move through their environment head first. 
We don't. We're upright. But if you think about worms and even your dog and your cat, they're moving through their environment head first, and they have to live by their senses. So it's very important that all their sensory organs are located on the head. This is called cephalization, forming a head. Radially symmetrical animals do not have a head. Therefore, radially symmetrical animals do not have a brain. Starfish do not have a brain. Jellyfish do not have a brain. There is no centralized brain-like organ to pull their movements together, and this is a big deal.